Hey guys, welcome to Spirit Pig. This is the show that explores how to live a fulfilled life. I'm Duncan CJ and today I'm speaking with David Burkus. David is a best-selling author of The Myths of Creativity, the truth about how innovative companies and people generate ideas, and his latest book, Under New Management, how leading organizations are upending business as usual. He's an award-winning podcaster and an associate professor of management at Oral Roberts University, and he's delivered keynotes all around the globe, and his work has been featured in the Harvard Business Review, Inc. Magazine, Fast Company, The Financial Times, and Bloomberg Business Week, to name just a few. So, David, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. You make me sound way cooler than I really am. <laughs> no, it was easy stuff. There was, I, I left stuff out, so you're, you're being modest. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you had a sort of a, a realization, I think, I mean, back in the day, and you suddenly had this realization uh, that started you off down this path, and that was that the stories that we tell ourselves are true, even if they're not true. What Could you maybe just elaborate on that? You have watched the Google talk. All right. <laughs> I did indeed. <laughs> Yeah, so this was it, what's interesting about that. That exact phrase is something that I didn't sort of stumble upon until after the Myth of Creativity was written, right? So, so I, my background is in organizational psychology, and one of the primary, you know, phenomenon that we study in psychology is the confirmation bias. This idea that you will selectively filter in or filter out information that conforms to your worldview. So, you know, I mean. Uh, you know, in the U.S., we just came out of a pretty contentious election cycle. And you could see you get on Facebook and your friends who are going for one candidate just are selectively filtering in or out information that confirms they made the right choice. And the same thing for the other candidate. Right. That's confirmation bias. And what I found in my research, I mean, this actually started as dissertation research, looking at trying to compare and contrast companies that are known for their creativity and innovation versus the sort of, you know, the the, the places that feel like the office or Dilbert or that yeah. type of thing, right? What is the difference? And one of the big, th big things I found was the language that's being used, the way that they describe the creative process and creative abilities and all that sort of stuff. And so that's when I kind of realized, oh, wait a minute, there's, there is a confirmation bias effect going on here. We're, we're telling ourselves these things about how creativity is supposed to work that just aren't true, but because you say them over and over and over again, they become true. And so it was about, it was maybe two or three months after the book was, was written and published. Somebody, somebody else actually said it. I was giving a talk and somebody came up in the audience and said like, yeah, I've always, you know, I've always, you know, believed that confirmation bias is dangerous. I tell people the stories that we say are true. And I like, and I just stumbled. It was like, oh, that's a really good way to say it. I'm going to steal that and start referring to it that way. So it's it's a it's like one of the, the it's the phrase I use to introduce kind of the whole concept of the book, and it's nowhere to be found in the book. <laughs> and so, if we kind of realize that we're kind of, I guess, dictated by these sort of stories. I mean, is the key the so the key to change is to perhaps tell ourselves better stories. You know, stories which are self empowering, stories which actually are going towards a goal that we actually want. Yeah, I mean, my preference would be that we tell ourselves stories that are actually true, <laughs> verifiably, <and> empirically. <laughs> But what I mean, what we for at least as it pertains to creativity and innovation, what we find is that the the truth, the actual empirical evidence, points to the fact that everybody has some level of creative ability. You know, there's not a you know, one of the one of the most common questions. Oh, is it nature? Is it nurture? And the, the the evidence supports yes, right? There might be some things like if you were if you were born tone deaf, it's really hard to become an amazing musician, right? But Inside of whatever range nature sets, everybody has this ability to grow their creative potential. And that's, that's verifiable psychological. So I would prefer people tell themselves that story. But yes, I mean, most commonly what you find when people feel like they can't hit their most creative self, you find that they're telling themselves a story that's, that's what's limiting them, their abilities. And, you know, my goal is to kind of replace that with the truth. The truth just happens to be a more empowering story. When when researching and like preparing for this interview, I mean, I, I came across a couple of like, yeah, a couple of in, like concepts and words, which, you know, I just never come across. And I loved um, you were uh, talking about the Peter principle. And uh, like, why, why does understanding this principle, why would understanding this principle like save both, I guess, ourselves and others a lot of unnecessary stress? Well, so, all right. So, so the Peter principle is both a, an explanation for why you're miserable <laughs> and, and also a warning, right? So the, so the Peter principle, it, it was actually, it started as satire. It was actually a joke from this academic Lawrence Peter. And he was trying to explain why in academia, it seemed like all of the administrators, the deans and the VPs and the provosts, et cetera, were incompetent. 
And so he proposed this idea that in any hierarchical system, right, most most companies, most organizations function on a hierarchy, boxes and lines and reporting relationships and things. And the most common reason people get promoted is they did a really good job in their job. So they get promoted to the next level. And then there's this weird phenomenon that we tend not to demote people when they do a bad job, right? We either let them stay where they are or we eventually fire them. But it's this idea that over time, what the Peter Principle says is that every individual in a hierarchy will rise to their level of incompetence, right? So you did a good job, you get promoted. You do a good job in that new role, you get promoted. You're not doing that good of a job in that previous role. Well, they're not going to fire you. You've got like, you know, five or 10 years of great work for this company. It's not a fireable offense, but they're going to try and give you some trainings and try and hire a coach and try and develop you to be better in this role. Most of the time it won't work. So they just let you sit there. So in a hierarchy, people tend to rise to their level of incompetence. So that explains why you're miserable and why your boss sort of seems incompetent. They may actually be the fact that they've been in that position for so long is kind of a hint that maybe they've hit their level of incompetence. But more importantly to me, it's a warning, right? So often when you, especially young people, you get hired into an organization, you feel like the, the goal is to climb up. The goal is to become a manager and then a regional manager or assistant to the regional manager to pull a, an office line, right? All, all of these, your goal is to climb up this corporate ladder. And the truth is that ladder will take you to a place, a, a level of your incompetence and you yourself won't actually be enjoying the work that you do. So it takes a lot of courage to say, you know what? I've, if I've found the job that I really thrive in and I do an amazing job here and this is where I really derive joy, no, I don't want that promotion. I don't want to climb. I want to get better at doing this one thing. And the, the end result, yeah, you might be leaving a little bit of money on the table or some extra benefits or a 401k or something like that, but you're going to be doing far more enjoyable work. And honestly, the truth is it's the people that can stay doing the work that they enjoy for so long that they get so good at it that they're indispensable and then those benefits tend to come anyway. Mm. So I guess, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because it flies, I mean, that advice kind of flies, we're, we're so torn, it's so ingrained in us, you know, it's always, you know, that next level, it's got to get to that next level, got to get to that next level. And so it kind of flies in the face of that where it's like, hey, you know, actually, I'm, I'm loving it right here. It's okay not to want to go to that next level or even not go up. Or if you are being forced to go to another level, it's okay to actually think maybe this company is not right for me after all. And then find a, find like a, what, an, another company where you can be in that level where you, where you thrive as opposed to always. Cause it, it's, it's, it's interesting. Cause on the one hand, it's like, you know, it's, we, we're talking, you know, it's good to be out of our comfort zone. And then, you know, when we're on the edge of, you know, comfort, that's when we often thrive. But a lot of this research is showing that, there's different types of thriving, maybe. Yeah, well, it's it's one thing to be outside of your comfort zone because you have room to grow into that field. It's a whole other thing to be out of your comfort zone because you're terrible at the job <laughs> and it makes you miserable, right? And it's it's the second one that we're really talking about. Yes, you. I mean, I definitely, you only ever grow outside of that zone of comfort. I mean, it's the old sort of like goldfish principle, right? That a goldfish will grow at, depending on the size of the bowl that they're in. But a goldfish won't ever become, a, you know, a sperm whale. It's just not going to happen, right? So there are certain limits and, and abilities and that sort of stuff. And so that's that's really – that's where, to be honest, the art comes in on the science, right, mm -hmm. is how do you figure out am I uncomfortable because I have room to grow or am I uncomfortable because I don't enjoy this and it's diverting focus away from things that I do enjoy. If it's the second one, then we've really got to talk about – where do you go from here? Do you have leave the organization or do I mean, I have a, I have a couple of friends, uh, sadly, only a few who in their career have done the very difficult work of saying, you know what, I would like to be demoted. I'd like to actually step back down into my other role because I was more comfortable there. Wow. And then that we're talking about sort of hierarchies and I guess on one hand, maybe quite a sort of um, old hierarchy management system is maybe outdated and inefficient like in my the second word that i learned for my brand new word of the day was holo 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 holocracy i'm i'm holocracy, holocracy. yeah like, what yeah. And I, I actually i googled it and then i went on the website and i was like wow like and then a lot of these companies which i respect you know like zappos and stuff like that and tony shea and people like that are talking about this what is what is holo holocracy Okay, so holacracy is a very specific way to manage a company without a management level, right? And and when I say very specific, here's what I mean. I'm not actually the biggest advocate of holacracy itself, okay. right? 
Holacracy has a creator. It has a company that really promotes it as the solution. And they're welcome to do that. Um, I don't. I tend to not advocate for any one solution because I think, I mean, their their approach would be that this holacracy system can be applied to almost any organization and work. My philosophy is every company is a little bit different. That said, almost every company in 2016 in a very information and creative age that we have, almost every company can benefit from having less of a management structure. You know, we're used to the idea that there are all sorts of reporting relationships and that managers are in charge of uh, making sure the people underneath them do all of the work. Nowadays, though, the challenge is the people on the front lines doing the work have to be so specialized and so highly skilled that it's actually really hard for one manager to keep track of five or seven people and know more about the task those five or seven people are supposed to be doing that they can effectively uh, manage them in the sense of making sure they're meeting uh, objectives and all that sort of stuff. The management role in most knowledge work organizations has really turned into one of a support role, making sure that you have the resources that you need, making sure, yeah, that you're not going over budget and that you're not going over time, but doing that from a place of supporting the people who are doing the work, not sort of making them accountable and dangling carrots and sticks in front of them. And so in my opinion, most organizations can take the work of management and give it to the teams that are doing it to some extent. Now, you might still have a team leader or you might still have a manager who is now managing lots of teams instead of just one team. I think, But I think most organizations can stand to get a bit flatter just because of the nature of the work that you're asking them to do. And holacracy is one way to do it. And, and it's it seems to be, it's been a rough transition, but it seems to be working fairly well for Zappos. And I think it also works fairly well for Medium, the company that um, Ev Williams yeah. started, you know, the Medium. Dot. So, um, you know, there's places where it Sorry, works. For, so, I, so for anyone I, who's just literally <clears throat> never heard that, I mean, it's just, it's basically just rather than, rather than the, like the top down management, like almost like the pyramid, it is, it's much more what like networks, much more like individual yeah, groups. Yeah, so they work in. Yeah, they work in, in, in circles and in work circles that have uh, authority over certain areas of the business and different people are in different circles and the circles are the ones that are sort of accountable to it. And it's like I said, it's it's a system that that can work. I don't know that you can take it and apply it to, you know, a, a factory that makes jet engines, although there are examples of factories that make jet engines, GE Durham in Durham, North Carolina, for example, that do very well with self-managed teams, which is a different approach than holacracy. So I don't think there's any one approach for getting at less of a management structure, but I think all of the approaches have some benefits and, and are worth consideration. Yeah, I mean, I'm talking to, I mean, I can always tell when we've got another podcaster like, on the line because they've always got like a good looking mic. You can see it on the left hand side. Yeah. Wh what do you have? You have a road? I got, yeah, I got a road podcaster. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my, I've got the Yeti from Blue. It's I actually, I finally have it on a boom arm. I used to have it just like <laughs> sitting on my desktop for the longest time. But we moved about four months ago and I could finally get a proper studio. Now, you, I was going to say that like, you, like, you, I think, is it 739 episodes? Like, that is... No, <clears throat> no, 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 it's not. It's probably, it's probably about 140, 150 uh, episodes. Okay, what? So what we do is I always liked um, I always liked television and like what like b before you could binge watch shows I was trying to binge watch shows through DVR and I always liked the way a television numbering system was usually four digits and the first two were the season and the second uh, two were the episode. Okay, so episode episode so from, seven <clears throat> is it episodes season se seven episode thirty eight nice right? or, or something like that right so from the very beginning you know our very first episode was one oh one. And so it wasn't that we did a hundred episodes. <laughs> it was just that it makes it easier for me to to pay attention to kind of what season they're in. Plus, the I mean, the other thing is that uh, we I very much do it through seasons. I I try I've tried to do like oh every single week we put one out, and with everything else that I'm doing, it's a little too difficult. So it's it's better for me to just sort of record a bunch and batch them as a season, and then and then go from there. Well, I was yeah. gonna say like um so like on on our show, I mean, we're on like episode eighty five, and despite talking to people from completely different walks of life background countries experiences like you start to notice you know some common themes arise again and again i was just wondering like you know you've got you know a slightly you know different topic but have you noticed a similar thing and if so like what kind of like i know principles or themes have really just i know stood the test of time or that you hear again and again yeah i well so i mean the the founding idea with our 
um, show with Radio Free Leader is better living through science, in essence, like that there is a wealth of social science that teaches you how to deal with people better in leadership, in forming corporate strategy and dealing with creativity and innovation. So that's I mean, that's always been no, nobody gets on there unless they are. Uh, steeped in that or they unknowingly conform to it, which is always a fun thing too, to bring somebody on because they're like, oh, we've been doing this forever. I'm like, yes, and that's a perfect example of this psychological principle. And they're like, uh, it is, <laughs> right? So um, so that's one thing. I think, you know, the, the other things I've seen, at least for individuals, um, the people that have really sort of been high, um, we'll call them high achievers for lack of a better term, are people who are really disciplined about their calendar. They're not people who... Um, do the time management approach of trying to get everything done. They're the people who are really clear about what they shouldn't be doing and find a way to stop doing it or delegate it or something like that so they can focus on what they do do. And then, I, I mean, a similar principle of elimination actually applies from a leadership or management standpoint. Most of the people that are managers or management theorists, the, at the core of what they're saying is most of the new ideas in how to lead people stem from the idea that if you if you're inherited, if you're in a bureaucratic organization that you're asked to sort of thrive in, one of the best things you can do is figure out what's holding your people back and eliminate it, not figure out this new perfect system for managing everybody, but just take the simple approach of going, huh, my people are always complaining about this. Let's find a way to remove that from their life so they can focus on what actually generates value. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, because it's completely most of us are trying to like, you know, do do more with our time and squish more into le like into the same amount of time but just eliminate all the superfluous stuff and then so you can really focus double down on the stuff which actually is really working and thriving right and i mean I, and I, that's I mean, that's a philosophy that i've sort of stumbled into over the past couple of years too i i made the huge mistake a couple months ago of reading um, Cal Newport's deep, deep work and uh, Greg McEwen's essentialism in like the same week and then I was convinced that I needed to re-examine my entire life and figure out, like, what are the things that I do that don't generate value? Can I find a way to eliminate them? And, I mean, it's it's been – well, it's actually great because I, I don't have to be as much of a um, – as strict with my calendar and all of that sort of stuff because I have less to do. But it's the activities that kind of generate value. So now that's a that's a constant thing that I'm – kind of involved in is figuring out who and what uh, projects I need to be investing in and figuring out which ones, honestly, I need to just sort of give myself permission to let dangle. And I mean, the sad thing is I, I kind of apply it to relationships too. I mean, we all have those people that like we hang out with out of a sense of loyalty. And yet every time we do, we end up drained and depressed and, and feeling like their problem is suddenly our problem. Sometimes like what I'd say is don't actively cut that person off, but like you know, stop calling them. And for like probably more than half of those people, you'll find that they're not calling you either. Right. So the, the phone works two ways. Text messages work two ways. And if you just deliberately stop that first way, if they don't respond, then give yourself permission to just kind of let that relationship fade. It was draining you anyway. I love it. And yeah, you, you sort of, you, like I mentioned in the, you, in the intro, like you podcast, you speak, you write, like all these things, like what, what is there, what's like sort of the driving force behind that? I mean, is it the same now as it, as it used to be, or is it kind of adapted over time? What, what, what motivates you today? Um, I mean, I, my core motivation or the core activity that I like to be involved in is that, um, I try and put handles on social science concepts so people can figure out how to use them. You know, so that is both books that I've written, both come from that. Um, the podcast kind of comes from that. In terms of um, activities, I mean, the the, po the podcast I run, Radio Free Leader, I would honestly do that be even if no one was listening. Because Same. as I'm sure you know, it like, so it's just fun to have those. Of course, I need people listening. Otherwise, I can't justify it, why it's worth time for the guests to come on. But um, it's it's been a hugely beneficial way for me to kind of sit at the feet of a lot of people um, smarter than me and, and then attempt to one day become their colleague, right? Um, <laughs> it, it, it unfortunately, like it sometimes takes a backseat to the need to write or the need to travel to speak and those sort of things. But it, it's I would say it's probably at the core of what I do because it's the first thing I did right before I was a university professor, before I wrote for any major publication or had my own books. I had this podcast that was really just about, you know, um, being in love with evidence based leadership principles and evidence based creativity and that kind of a thing. And that that gave birth to everything else. So that's really kind of at the core of it. That said, I I was an undergrad English major and I consider myself sort of a writer who does everything else. Mm. 
right? Mm-hmm. So that kind of, that comes first in kind of mentally, but in terms of appreciation for my career, the, the podcast is at the center generating the, the benefits. The writing just happens to be what I would prefer to be known for, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. Now, you, you, mentioned, um, you mentioned at the beginning, you said, oh, you must have um, listened to uh, the Google talk. Like one one, one yeah. bit that I loved in that, it cracked me up. It's like, so, I mean, like Google, obviously, pretty much, you know, like, you know, the guys behind, like, Gmail, like, one of, like, you know, the biggest, like, email, like, things, you know, in the world. And I like how you kind of just, you ask them, and you come a bit sheepishly, you're like, guys, like, who, honestly, put your hand up if you actually hate email. <laughs> and then you suddenly saw that everyone could, like, some of them, like, put their hands up and put them down. But you are, like, you're not an advocate for, I mean, you could propose that, you know, this whole addiction to email, 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 then suddenly needing, you know, when you send one, then often somebody's on the other end and actually then they could feel almost peer pressure to kind of send a quick reply back. Like, I, 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 I also am uh, coming from your camp being like, come on, let's just tone down the email use. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I know because every time I've emailed you, I get a reply that says you're not going <laughs> to respond for like four days, <laughs> um, which is which is a bit of the, the Tim Ferriss approach, yeah, yeah, et cetera. Exactly. And that's probably... Tim's probably the first uh, version I heard of that. I'll confess when I first heard of it, I, my response was like, well, that just seems rude. Like, why would you do that? At the, at the same point, there really is this weird feeling that you're supposed to respond immediately. Like if if you asked anyone logically what's an appropriate amount of time to respond to an email in, they would probably say 24, 48 hours, Right. If you ask them emotionally, they're like, well, I just sent it and then I went and got a coffee and came back and they haven't replied yet. What's the problem? Right. And this this creates a lot of tension, especially for organizations. I mean, in under new management, I actually advocate for them outlawing email or at least putting severe limits on it, because in, in organizations, it, it really is damaging from two fronts. A, uh, if you're emailing at all hours, you're not letting people actually be at home with their friends and loved ones and asleep and doing all the things they need to do to be effective when they get back to work. But B, even at work, if their outlook is going off or their Gmail is going off every five minutes, then how likely is it that they're actually able to focus and do the deep work that, that creates value? So uh, that said, I mean, I, I've, I've seen a lot of companies that have managed to outlaw it in, internal email entirely, and that'd be awesome. I'm more of that sort of solopreneur model, so I haven't found a way to do it. So what I do is just limit it, and I kind of batch it at two points in a day. Nobody gets an autoresponder. For me, I just am practicing being really bad at email yeah. <laughs> and then hoping that that trains people um, that I don't you don't expect a response in 24 hours. So I will, you know, about um, about probably eight o'clock between eight and nine in the morning, I'll respond to sort of that first batch. And then if there's anything that requires like deep thought or, or anything else, I'll save it to about four in the afternoon. But in that middle, I'll see it. I see it come in. I just won't reply to it because I've got other things I need to focus on. I like that. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that concept of training. Like, you know, eventually, like after a few months, everyone's like, oh, like it's not rude. David's just shit at email. And they, oh, Duncan's crappy email. Right. And it's, it's, it's your right. thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's actually, and that's a tool that I, I, I stole from Cal Newport, the author of Deep Work, because that's what he said he does inside. He works in a university, and that's what he basically says he does is he just deliberately is bad at email, won't respond to some emails unless somebody actually calls him out and asks him a question or or will purposely wait for three or four days before he replies just to train people. I'm like, that's not rude. That's just how he is. And so you you eventually – Everyone who interacts with you frequently expects it, and they know that if they don't hear anything for you for two for two days, it's it's not an issue. It's not like you disappeared off the face of the earth. You're just crap. <laughs> who have been uh, Who have been some of the biggest influences on your work? Um, so my my intellectual heroes are people like uh, Roger Martin at the University of Toronto. He's the one that really pioneered um, design thinking and and a concept called integrative thinking, which was this idea that. We tend to look at the world in either or models and make decisions as either or, but the best leaders are the ones that figure out how to sort of have both, right? So even before like Covey was advocating for the yes and, Roger was taking a much more empirical stance to this. So intellectually, he's one. In terms of sort of who are the writers and the speakers and things I I emulate, I'm not shy about uh, saying how much I admire Dan Pink and his model, um, his writing style and his ability to really, like I said, I mean, I, I use the phrase... Uh, put handles on social science concepts and make them easier to use. That's essentially what Dan does as well. Uh, You know, Drive is really just Edward Desi and Richard Ryan's research. And he'd have no problem telling you this. The problem is uh, DC and and Ryan were terrible at explaining how revolutionary their concept was. So they needed Dan, right? And that's kind of been my goal too, is to find similar concepts and 
and make it easier to to give the, honestly the the scientists that usually discover them to give them credit for it, but make it easier for people to actually benefit from uh, learning about them. So rather than these like amazing concepts like stay in academic journals, to have almost like a segue, somebody to actually describe to like the masses, like hey, this is this is one head of an idea, like you know, but actually to right, package right. it like in the, the way that's. The, the the secret reason that the podcast is called Radio Free Leader, it's a play on words, right? It's it's a joke that I have to explain, so it's bad. It's obviously a bad joke. But there is a – I mean it's, it's radio free. It's a podcast, right? So it's the internet. It's not actually on radio waves. But it's also a call to uh, the concept of Radio Free Europe and the idea that you were broadcast – we were broadcasting over the wall – into the Iron Curtain. I think uh, it's the same thing. There needs to be somebody broadcasting out from the act from the ivory tower into the corner office where people can actually use it. So it's a bit of a play on words, but it's it's I've as I've found, it's a really bad joke <laughs> that most people don't get. And I have to explain it, which just proves it's a really bad joke. What does a fulfilled life mean to you? Um, I mean, to me, I, I think, again, to go back to that idea of elimination, I think a fulfilled life is actually the one in which you're not doing anything other than those activities that really generate value and generate joy. And I think the thing that frustrates people is usually not that they're not doing the things that they love. It's that they're do, having to do so many other things. They don't have enough time to really do those things that they love. So that's that's probably the biggest is a properly eliminated life. <laughs> And what is one thing all our listeners can start doing today that have a big positive impact on their lives? I figure out what you hate doing and stop doing it. I mean, honestly. Um, and the truth is we, we don't do that out of a fear that someone will call us on it. But you would be shocked how many times if you just sort of stop doing something, people will stop hassling you to get it done and just concede that you won't do it, find someone else to do it for them. And then you have successfully eliminated some useless task from your life. What's next? What's next for you? So we're in the midst of writing uh, book three, which uh, I won't tell you about. I'll, I'll make you make, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll force you to have me back <laughs> to talk about it later. Um, but we're in the midst of that, which means a lot of, I mean, I'm trying to live that focused time and trying to hit my, my word count every day as I crank out that manuscript and then making time for, for these kind of interviews. But yeah, that's the big next project that we're working on is book three. Awesome. And last but not least, where can we send people? How can they find out more about you, like other books, your work? Yeah. So the best, the absolute best place is davidberkus.com, B-U-R-K-U-S.com. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate. I've got a really weird, um, spelled last name, which means domains and usernames and things are always open. It's fantastic. So, um, that's probably the easiest. The podcast is housed on there. The books are all there and there's a ton of just free resources there too. If you want to check it out. So davidberkus.com would be the best place to go. The podcast is like, I was just looking down some of, you know, your past guests and, you know, some of the people. And I mean, it's it, seriously, it's like, it's just like some of the, yeah, some of the really, the top, top thinkers in the world. It's some really fantastic people that you've, you've interviewed. And um, yeah, I recommend checking it out. So David, thank you so much. It's been great fun. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.